magnetism. Uh, lesson number one, part B, as we continue in magnetism. So magnets generally, you will have seen ferrite magnets and because they're made of ferrite they have this uh, grey appearance to them as though they're kind of made out of some kind of um, alloy which is exactly what they are. There is rare earth magnets and they're made out of uh, metal alloys and so they have this shiny metal appearance and specially formed magnets that uh, are made out of special um, Alenco material. So the example here, the ferrite, the Alenco, which is kind of an aluminium nickel cobalt alloy and rare earth magnets are the most typicals that you will come across. Probably the ferrites and the rare earth are the most predominant. So what is a paramagnetic material? So far we've looked at um, different kinds of magnetic materials, but what's a paramagnetic material? Remember we mentioned this in lesson one. So they are and weakly attracted to a magnet. So they don't have a strong influence, but are starting a slight or weak influence. They include aluminium, platinum, magnes, magnesium, um, chromium, and would you believe oxygen? has a magnetic effect. They have a permeability slightly higher than one and become weakly magnetized in the same direction as the magnetic force. They have far less strength than a ferromagnetic magnet and lose their magnetism when the magne magnetizing force is removed. So they only become a magnet when there's another magnet nearby and as soon as that magnetic field is removed, they lose their magnetism. That's probably the most strongest characteristic of a paramagnetic material. What about diamagnetic materials? They also become weakly magnetized, but in the opposite direction to the magnetizing force. Hence the word dia, meaning in the opposite direction. They have a permeability of less than one. They include bismuth, carbon graphite, and the strongest magnetic materials. Also include mercury, copper, gold, silver, water, diamonds, wood, and living tissue, which are less strong in their effect, but they are diamagnetic materials. That is the magnetic forces brought near them actually reverses and goes in the opposite direction. Non-magnetic material is kind of everything that's kind of left after that, isn't it? So they have a permeability of one. They have no effect on a magnetic field. They include air, wood, plastic, water, paper, cloth and fabrics are not affected by a magnetic field. In other words, they don't become magnetized either permanently or temporarily. And they have no effect on the magnetic field. So the magnetic field does not affect them and they don't have any effect on the magnetic field. For most purposes include paramagnetic and domatic materials, which are also kind of considered non-magnetic. So how do we go about preserving magnets? So a magnet of any type will lose some or all of its magnetism if it's exposed to a high temperature because what that does is it mixes up all the molecules and they're no longer in a line and if they're no longer in a line it's no longer a magnet. The loss of magnetism is complete at a Curie temperature of about 770 degrees C. But for neridium, you've got to get it only up to 300 degrees C. In either case, it's pretty damn hot. But all you're doing is releasing all the molecules from being lined up, and they float around anywhere they like, and we've no longer got a magnet. Hammering or jarring a magnet will also affect its magnetic strength for the same reason. 
if you can force the molecules and the electrons to all get jumbled up and no longer be in a nice straight line, then great, you've no longer got a magnet. And I don't know whether you've realised that, uh, that's how we used to magnetise our screwdrivers to pick up screws, and then when we want to demagnetise them, you just bang the end of the screwdriver with a hammer. It just messes up all the molecules. A magnet can lose its magnetic strength if it's exposed to another magnetic field. So one magnetic field can reverse the effects of another. Quite often we use things called magnetic keepers. So a little bit of soft iron put across either face of magnets will keep the magnetic field and the flux within the magnets and they will last a lot longer. So a magnet, magnet should be kept or stored with an iron keeper to preserve their magnetic strength. So the law of attraction and repulsion. Now I'm sure you've played with magnets as kids, those kinds of things most of us have. So these are just two basic laws of magnetism. Unlike poles attract each other. It's nice and simple. A north and a south will want to pull each other together very, very strongly to create one large, complete magnetic field. Unlike poles, like if you try to push um, two south poles together, you'll find it very, very difficult, or two north poles together, very, very difficult. So like poles attract, sorry, unlike poles attract, and like poles repel. I do a little experiment with some of my students quite often. I get two rare earth magnets and see if I can get uh, one of my, any of my students would like to volunteer to see if they can uh, push the two north poles together. And uh, there's plenty of volunteers. No one has succeeded to date. Magnetic shielding. So if we have a magnetic shield that can conduct the magnetic field away from that which we want to shield, we end up with this effect called magnetic shield. A magnetic shield keeps the magnetic flux away from an area, pro providing a high permeability path around the area. An example is steel strewed conduit for data cabling. So I've many times had to run um, highly sensitive data cabling through uh, industrial areas and uh, we always use steel screwed conduit for the purpose because it helps protect the conduit. So quite often this stuff here we use steel conduit. Why steel? Because it's a magnetic conductor. So steel conduit And, for example, if I have a large conductor with some, maybe a three-phase conductor, and it's conducting a lot of current, then you get magnetic fields around the conductors, and these magnetic fields can interfere with maybe a data cable, a Cat5 cable, that's inside the conduit. So you might have a Cat5 data cable inside here. And of course, that magnetic field is now deviated through the soft iron of the steel conduit. And of course, we end up with no magnetic field interfering inside the conduit. So it's great magnetic shielding, but it only offers magnetic shielding. It doesn't offer electrostatic shielding or capacitive shielding. So only magnetic shielding, which is the main one that causes problems when you've got data cable being run close to high energy power cables. So there's a perfect application of where we use magnetic shielding because simply 
the magnetic field wants to take the path of least resistance and that is through the soft iron of the steel conduit as an example. So magnetic flux is the total number of lines of a magnetic force produced by a magnet. Remember we talked about flux and lines of force. So flux is the total number of lines of magnetic force produced by a magnet. It's measured in Weber's after Mr. Weber, abbreviated capital W small b, where one Weber equals 100 million lines of force. So it's times 10 to the power of 8. So 100 million lines of force. And remember, it's Weber's are about how many lines of force. Just a matter of counting them. And again, when we have a look at our little practical, you will actually be able to see the lines of force. It's known by the symbol phi, which sometimes is also used for measuring angles and degrees. But here we use phi to indicate or measure Weber's or the number of lines of magnetic force. A typical horseshoe magnet produces a flux of 0 0.001 Webers or about 10,000 lines of force. Expressed with a prefix that would be 0 0.001 Webers becomes 1 or 0.1 I should say 0.1 of a milliweber. So we're just using our engineering notation to say our 100 lines of force here expressed in Webers is 0 0.001 of a Weber. But let's move the decimal point. 1, 2, 3 here. We can now talk in milliwebers. So our Weber becomes 0 0.1 milliwebers. So that's how we get the milliwebers. And for calculations, it's simply written 0.1 times 10 to the minus 3, because times 10 to the minus 3 represents millis or thousandths of. Flux density is the next thing we have to understand. So we've got all these lines of uh, magnetic force. Flux density is how spread out or how dense those lines of force are. So that's what flux density is. And here we've got an object that's uh, 20 millimeters by 20 millimeters. That's the area. I'm just drawing around the area there. And you can see that the lines of magnetic force are reasonably well spread out. And of course, this is the a north pole of a magnet. Here we've got a quarter of that amount. So 10 by 10 is a quarter of 20 by 20 in area. And you can now see much, much, much denser and much closer together our lines of magnetic force are. So we've got the same number of lines. There are 50 lines of force, but instead of being spread over 400 square millimeters, down here we're spread over 100 square millimeters. And again, if you look on our right hand side on C, you can see the flux coming out of our magnet here and it's being concentrated or compressed down into our piece of soft iron. So as it comes back out again, it's well compressed, but as it goes up into the air, it decompresses and spreads out. So we're getting less flux per square area. So flux density is simply all about how many lines of flux we can get in a particular amount of square area space. So if we want to work flux density out, it's a pretty simple equation. The equation for flux density is B equals phi on A 
Um, B is the flux density, and this is measured, if you remember, in Tesla's or Weber's per meter squared, but we prefer to use Tesla's. The flux is in Weber's, so it's in straight Weber's, the total number of lines of magnetic force, and area is the cross-sectional area in square meters. When we start to do calcs and things, don't get caught with that one. Make sure you understand we're working in meters squared. We're not working in millimeters squared. We're working in meters squared. So our formula is simply flux density B. That's this one. It's measured in Teslas. Our flux or phi is in Weber's. And A is simply area, cross-sectional area in square meters. And of course, we have to mention that the Tesla is named after Mr. Tesla, inventor of AC, the cola. So one Tesla equals one Weber per square meter. So I've got a one full Weber over one square meter it equals one Tesla. That is at one Tesla, that is times 10 to the eight lines of force in an area of one square meter. So it's just a simple relationship. Fixed number of lines of force spread or averaged over the area tells us the flux density in Teslas. So again, just a reminder, this slide to remind us that it's all about the lines of force. In this case, there's 50 of them. If we spread them out over a large area, we've got low density. If we take the same number, 50, lines of force, but we put them through a much smaller area, then we've got high density. And density is measured in Teslas. So here's a little example. Let's say I have a number of Webers is um, 0 0.5 micro Webers and I've got two areas I want to play with my area A is over 400 millimeters squared and 100 millimeters squared like our previous example so that's all we're doing we're actually doing the math around here our 20 by 20 and our 10 by 10 and now we're going to do the maths. We've got 0.5 micro Weber. So if we want to know what the flux density is for our 400 square millimeters, it's simply B is equal to phi divided by the area. So in this particular case, we end up with 0.5 divided by 400 now times 10 to the minus 6 because we converted our 400 up into square meters rather than square millimeters so here it is 400 square millimeters and we get that up into square meters it becomes minus 6 so 0.5 divided by 400 means that we have 0.00125 Teslas or if I want to move the decimal point three places to the right to make the number a bit more manageable we end up with about 1.25 milliteslas for area B this now is our hundred millimeters squared convert that up into square meters that's going to be 100 times 10 to the minus 6 to get into square meters so 
Again, we're going to have our 0.5 now divided by 100. And we end up with 0.05 or 5 millitesla's. So you can see here, effectively, we have much lower density. And here we have much higher density. So that's all we were demonstrating there, difference between high density, low density, and the number of Teslas. So some applications for permanent magnets um, on many uh, lathes and milling machines. Magnetic chucks are one of the, uh, the big uses. So lathes and milling machines. I'm sure you've probably played with magnetic tape Lots of advertising comes these days to stick things on your fridge and it's got a piece of magnetic tape glued on the back of it. Also, magnetic conveyor belts. So just a conveyor belt itself impregnated with magnetic material to keep the items, of obviously something made of soft iron. And magnetic rollers, often used uh, with conveyors that don't have a magnetic belt, but have an ordinary belt, and the magnetic belt uh, magnetic roller actually uh, helps pull magnetic material off the conveyor belt and the next one is the reed switch and these are very very small switches in a glass tube and the switch will open and close if a magnetic field is brought near the switch so quite often used in security applications as door and window opening and closing detectors so quite often you'll have a magnet in the wind in the window and on the sill you have embedded a reed switch and if the magnetic field hits the reed switch it actually causes the switch to close and you get a signal into the system to tell you whether the door is or the window is open or closed So let's sum up lesson one. So this is a summary for part A and for part B. A magnet can be made by exposing a ferromagnetic material to another strong magnetic field. The process is called magnetic induction. And there's the single touch method and the double touch method. So as the magnet is inducing magnetism into the ferromagnetic material. A magnet has a north pole and a south pole. The north pole of a magnet points towards the Earth's magnetic pole. And that's just an arbitrary way we've decided to label magnets. Unlike magnetic poles attract and like magnetic poles repel. That's the rules or the law of magnetism. A magnetic field or flux consists of lines of force that flow from the north pole of a magnet to the south pole. They don't physically flow, remember, they just are indicated to flow. Lines do not cross each other, they all have the same magnetic strength and although they have direction, they don't actually physically move. So materials have got uh, three basic classification magnetic Materials. It's ferromagnetic, they are strongly attracted to a magnetic field. Paramagnetic, which are weakly attracted by having another strong magnetic field nearby. Oxygen is an example of that. And dynamic, or diamagnetic I should say. Um, weakly repelled by a strong magnetic field. Things like living tissue will do that. A magnet can lose its magnetism as a result of excess heat because we've mixed up all the molecules. So physical vibration and stress, like I mentioned, you can get your screwdriver magnetized. You want to unmagnetize it, just start tapping it with a hammer, you'll unmagnetize it. And through exposure to a magnetic field of the opposite polarity, we'll also demagnetize things.
A soft iron keeper across the poles of a magnet helps keep that magnetism and retain its mag retain its ability and its magnetism. Magnetic flux, the symbol phi is measured in Webers, where one Weber is one million or times ten to the eight lines of force. Most magnetic fields have a flux in the order of milli Webers or at least micro Webers. So they really only have small amounts. Flux density, we use the capital letter B, refers to the number of lines of force in any given area. And of course, we measure that in Teslas, named after our friend Nikola Tesla. B is measured in Teslas, where the one Tesla equals one Weber of flux per square meter. So our formula simply is B in Teslas is phi in Webers divided by area in square meters. So that brings us to the end of electromagnetism, lesson one part B and the summary for both part A and B.